Good evening, Grilling Truth fans. Good evening, wrestling fans. We are lucky to have Luke Williams of the Bushwhackers with us tonight. Thank you, Luke, for joining us. Good day, friends, fans, and even enemies. How the bloody hell are you tonight? It's great to be on Grueling Truth with you, James. So what's hey. up, mate? Not too much. We're just excited about having you on the show, getting to relive some of your great moments in the sport of professional wrestling. Yeah, that, it's, it's uh, great to be here, mate. And boy, it was a life. Hey, hey. I span from 1962 right up to now. I'm still, before this um, pandemic, I was still traveling around the country, Canada and um, U.S., doing um, comic cons, wrestling conventions, and hopping in the squared circle, This old di- moving this old dinosaur around in the squared circle. I don't actually do much bumping around anymore, mate. I just do a lot of arm swinging, ass kicking, and head licking. Exactly. A lot of fun stuff. Yeah, I was going to say, I've seen you out there with uh, Fred Oatman, uh, Tugboat, on a lot of different, like you said, conventions and things like that. Yeah, I do. I do a lot. So going back to the very beginning, what sports did you play growing up? I played rugby. I played the man sport, rugby. Not like NFL where they have to wear all pads. No, I love NFL today. But when I first saw it, when I first come over here and saw NFL, it, it was uh, uh, we laughed. You know, you know, you're on the t- you're on the field for a few minutes. Something happens. They move the whole team off and a new team on. And rugby, when I was playing in that, you'd play you'd play half an hour, then you'd have um, 10 minute break and you play a half an hour and if someone got injured you, uh, unless the other captain said you could have someone else on you played with 14 men instead of 15 men wow i mean that's some dedication where that's, you know, why, the, that's why the forwards weren't as heavy as you know your front line uh, you know your offensive line and the defensive line they're big boys well yep. those days the um our, our forwards were only about a heavy one at the most was 250, 240, 250, because I think it may be different today, but you're on the field all that time. So the way I understand it, your neighbor who was a bodybuilder introduced you to professional wrestling? Yes, he did. Yep. He, he won a bodybuilding contest and that, or was placed second to Mr. New Zealand, and the, the judge of Mr. New Zealand was a former Miss New Zealand come wrestling promoter. And he said to my um, neighbor, he says, hey, would you like to make some money with that body? And of course, the guy said, how? He didn't know that he didn't know the guy ran a wrestling promotion or anything. And that we lived out, we lived outside the capital city by eight miles, lower hut. And um, he said, you will come into a while, come into the gym. It was Coolman's Gymnasium in Wellington, notorious gymnasium, many Commonwealth champions in boxing and amateur wrestling come out of there. And um, this was 1961. So he started going in there, and then six months down the line, he, he got me to come with him. And I was 170, 175 soaking wet those days. The way I understand it, uh, before your first match, you really didn't have much uh, training. They kind of just threw boots at you and said, hey, uh, go for it. Uh, yeah, I'd been going in the gym with, with Brian, who is his professional name is Bruno Becker, and then I was going into the gym with him for about six months, four months, I guess. Then I'd been to one live show. That's all. I'd been to one live show. By now, I, you know, I was into wrestling, so I bought a few magazines. At the time, we had no television until 67. So I bought, bought you know, the, the American wrestling magazines. Actually, uh, one of my friends, I used to, uh, George Napolitano, he was writing magazines from the late 60s onwards, but I don't think these were his at the time. And um, that's all I'd seen. And the second time I went to a match... And that the guy, one of the guys that arrived, the light heavyweight guy, next minute, I got thrown a pair of boots and a tank top. I had a pair of jeans on, and I was in the ring. 
Nice. So uh, I, I said, re- hey James, I don't mm-hmm. remember a thing of the match. Definitely, I was gonna say I can imagine an experience like that. It'd be a bit of a blur. Um, after that, did you end up going to a professional trainer? Did someone officially teach you the sport of wrestling, or was it something no, no, you kind of learned? I'd been in the gym, I'd been in the gym with my um, with with Brian Ashby, and and of course the guy training everyone there was the former Mister New Zealand who had been wrestling for about ten years. I've been on the mat with them. I've been on the mat with a lot of people. You know, when I went to the gym with them, I was there for three hours at a time. So oh, my. Two, three times a night, you mm-hmm. know, nine hours a week in the ring. And the rings were boxing rings. The floor was solid and there was four ropes. And the ropes were 20, inches, 20 feet apart. They were big rings. And I understand the, uh, the sport of wrestling was kind of run by the law enforcement at one time? Yes, there, yes. The, the law enforcement came to the arena first. The promoter had to send all the names in where if he was running a town, he had to send the, all the names who were going to be on the card to the police station in that, pre, in that, ta- in that city. And, that, and if anyone had a criminal conviction in that, they wouldn't let him work. And, <laughs> you know, and then... Um, they would come the night of the show, an hour and a half beforehand, and um, or an hour beforehand, and they would measure the re- ropes. This is a stupid. It sounds stupid to make sure it was twenty feet between twenty feet. What if it, what if it was nineteen feet? Nineteen feet. What the hell? They exactly. Had twenty feet by twenty feet. And, yeah, I agree with. And and. and um, you know the tables they use at comic cons and wrestling conventions, the six foot fold up tables, the little uh-huh. six foot ones. Well, they that was right against the ring on one side with a bell ringer, and the police sat there. You couldn't stop, you couldn't kick anybody or punch anyone with a fist. You had to do forearms or uppercuts. Uh, you know, with the with the British style uppercuts with the forearms yeah. under their chest. And then well, you, have, you could do knee drops. But if you put the boot to someone or punch someone, the priests are up in the ring and, the, and they were disqualified and the match was over. And you had rounds. You had the main events, heavyweights, had eight eight-minute rounds. And if you didn't do six of them, the people wouldn't come back the next time. And then the other, other, other uh, matches were eight five-minute rounds. So, how did you end up meeting Butch Miller? Uh, one, one second, mate. Keep talking. Okay. Just close the door. No my worries. It's all good. Get, my girls are getting a bit nasty. <laughs> oh yeah, they, they, and dogs can be fun, can't they? So, uh, so how did you end up meeting uh, Butch Miller? Yeah, sorry, I'm just away a minute, mate. I'm coming back. No I'm worries. Going to close a few doors. Oh, no worries. It's okay. all good. Okay, how do I beat, beat Butch Miller? Yes, sir. Well, let's see. We go with cousins in the business. We, we, we're not really cousins. But, but that was the... Uh, a lot of people thought we were brothers. But um, no, <laughs> Butch was training at a different gym. He was he was still playing rugby. And that... And... Um, and uh, he was training at a YMCA. Actually, in the capital city, one year he was Mr. Chess, Bob the Chess Miller. That was his nickname. <laughs> Anyhow, um, he he got he he uh, was with another guy in that gym who was a wrestler, and he was an outlaw promotion. He just ran a few shows now and again, not like the main promotion in the country that I was working for. You know, from the. Uh, former Mr. New Zealand, not that company. And uh, and then uh, he came over, he realized he realized in a short time after about four matches that he was working for a, a shitty company. <laughs> and um, re- came over to our house and then in 86, in six, 66, sorry, in 66, and we started tagging up, not full time, but we do a single, a lot of, a lot of smaller towns, not the main towns, smaller towns, 
we'd work a single in the first in the first half. He would work a single. Then after intermission, we'd come back with a tag against the same two guys that we worked in the singles. And that was, these promoters were trying to save money in the small towns, you know, with talent-wise. Definitely. Our, um, we, ta- we tagged up then, but the, and we started touring around the country then. In 66, the country started running s- seven days a week. And um, so, it, mm-hmm. so we're on the road... We're on the road driving everywhere because New Zealand, except to fly, go across the other island with flu. But there's New Zealand's two islands, approximately 600 miles long each island and about 150 miles across at the widest spot. So was that around the time you became the Kiwis? Yeah, no, not then, not then. We were working, it was, we were working as Sweet William in New Zealand I was I I always worked as a fag when I started single, and that I put more weight on by now. And we started we started working as Sweet William and 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 uh, Brute Miller. His, and I, his name was Brutal Bob Brutal Bob Miller, and and Sweet William. We were the we were the uh, what is it called now? The Beauty and the Beast. Oh, cool. He was the beast and I was the beauty. So I understand you were kind of inspired by Gorgeous George. Yes, I was. Because in the early 60s, a guy from Australia who had come from England and had met Gorgeous George, he was working the same style. He was Murphy the Surfy, but he was working as a fag, flamboyant, blonde hair, and that. And I copied him because I was... By 66, 67, uh, 68, we're going to Australia. The American promoter, Jim Barnett, who was notorious in the business in the 60s and 70s, and, and even in the 80s, you know, he was with Crockett in the NWA. He was with Vince McMahon in the office, helping them out. But he was the one that started coast-to-coast wrestling here in the 60s. He owned territories. He came down in 65, he came down to Australia and opened up WCW. Well, that was his name, World Championship Wrestling in Australia. And he brought a whole American crew down there, even the announcers. And um, that's how that's how we, and we started going over there. So I understand at that point, that was what, during Vietnam? Big pardon? That was during Vietnam? Yes. Australia was booming at the time from 65 onwards because all the, uh, the the young guys from Vietnam were coming down there for a week for rest and recreation. And it was cheap. You know, it was very cheap. And they'd come down with $1,000 for a month. Now, in 66, $1,000, you know, a meal was $3 then. Breakfast yeah. was one and a quarter. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. A big meal, a big meal, three course meal was three dollars, and they had they'd come down with a thousand. So um, Sydney, Australia, was booming with um, with all the people coming down there, young guys coming down there from Vietnam. So of course you were, you know, over there when it was booming. But after that, I understand you ended up going up to Canada with Stu Hart. Yes, we first worked. Which of me was working in and out of Australia for Jim Barnett and that. And then in, in 72, I was 71 or 72, he come over. He had to get out of Australia because of um, money reasons with uh, taxes, I guess, and all that sort of stuff. He did, he did 85 business, 85% business from 65 to 72. That's how his business was. In oh, the wow. Ring. That, that was, the wrestling was booming. Of course, he had all the great stars from Madison Square Garden, Killer Kowalski. He had all the top guys in the States. Was that around the time you were with Andre the Giant? Yeah, and Andre came to New Zealand in, in 1970, 69, 70, and Butch and me worked around New Zealand with him in, in, in handicap matches. The stuff we did then, people would laugh today, but um, the moves we did with them then, 
were short and sweet, but the people went, went off their rockers. They loved it. Andre was 350 pounds with big curly, lean. He looked lean then with a big afro. And I understand. He was agile. Anyhow, he, he came over here. In the 1970, Butch and me were going up to um, Singapore and Bangkok. Butch, was, Butch went to Japan first for Anoki, and that, for Anoki's first tour. And then, he, then he, um, we were going up to Singapore, and then in the 72, started 72, the New Zealand promoter Steve Rickard had spoken to the Bashans, two well-known wrestlers from the um, from the late 60s and, se- and mid 60s and 70s Butcher Vinshon and Mad Dog uh, Morris Vinshon I don't know where you ever heard of them oh yeah actually I'm having uh, Paul on the show uh, next Wednesday you having Paul yeah yeah just talked to him the other day oh you, you say to Paul Say you just talked to, uh, I was Sweet William when I went to him, and they changed Butcher's name to Nick Carter because the brood, oh, oh. A brutal Bob Miller was already a brute had been in Canada working for them. The brute from the brute um, from the Carolinas, Brute Barnard, it was brute, and there was another brute too, Bugsy McGraw from Florida. So they they made him change his name from Brute, and he, they called him Crazy Nick Carter when we first come into Canada. Paul is the main one that did, that, that did all the stuff for this deal. Oh, definitely. So he, was of, he was more or less the guy that bought us. They owned the promotion. You know, it was a major promotion at the time. I don't know whether you know if you look at the history of the wrestling, but the hottest places in North America for wrestling in the... Um, Early 70s, you know, from Andre came there in 72, right half a year before us. But the hottest spots, 72, 73, was Montreal and Toronto. Well, the office was out of Montreal and Toronto. That that was the the hot bed of wrestling throughout the whole United States at the time. Exactly. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, yeah, Toronto and Montreal, and then. Uh, the Carolinas, I understand, were big as well, uh, but yeah, that was a different Boston, promotion. It was, it was yeah, they, they were big, but Montreal, we, we, you know, we did a, we did Jerry Park at the time in '73. We did thirty thousand, twenty nine thousand six hundred or four hundred in Jerry Park. That's where yeah. they had the Empire Games a few years before. That was, they said that apart from the the rate, apart from Pat O'Connor. And Buddy Rogers, that was the um, the record breaker, you know, at the time. That was the biggest house around at the time. So um, the way I understand it, at uh, around that time, you ended up going and working for Stu Hart up in uh, Stampede Wrestling. Yeah, we yes. after after um, after spending a year and a half. In Montreal, this this company, um, what's called Grand Prix, it was running two to three towns a night, mate. And then opposition was running two. Jock and Jack Rougeau, they were running one town a night. So there were four cities in Ontario and Quebec running every night. Major promotion, major television. That shows you how hot it was. I think oh. even even Rougeaus were running two towns a night. So exactly. Place, yeah, I mean, and everyone was the thing was red hot. Wrestling was red hot at the time. Exactly, it was a golden age of wrestling. I mean, like you said, there were so many stars and so much talent there. Uh, yeah. And then I understand because of uh, great advice you got from uh, Abdul the Butcher that you were child abusers. <laughs> a child abuser? I, I say it tongue in cheek. Oh, you yeah, beat up. Yeah. You beat up yeah, Sue's kid. Now I got it. Paul said to us, in, 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 out of the Montreal office, he said to us, um, you know, we'd like, if you stay on now, we'll have to get start using you as jobbers to help get new guys get over. He says, but if you leave now, we were, we, we were one of the, in the smaller towns, we were one of the main events every night, or, you know, semi-main. And that. we'd wrestle the Vachons, we'd wrestle Capontier and the Giant, you know, 
we were on that level every night. They were the main stars. So we were right up there. And he said to us, you know, we've got to bring new faces in. So he says, we'd like to bring you back in, uh, bring you back down the road. But um, I've talked to a promoter, the name of Stu Hart. Now, I'd never heard of this guy, the, the notorious Stu Hart and Stampede Wrestling. That was what a big name in wrestling, too. I'd never heard of it. And um, he said, uh, he sent us there. So the first night, there was two, in the fairgrounds, there was two buildings, the pavilion where they did the TV on Friday night and the corral. Now, the corral is not there anymore. The Saddle Dome, that's where they do a lot of paid reviews and the hockey and all that. That's a big arena. You know, I think it was about 40,000. And that, uh, the Saddle Dome, I'm not sure, 30 or 40,000. But uh, at the time... Stu Hart, this weekend we came in, we didn't know, but he was running a double, sh a double show that weekend. He did it three times a year. He'd run the pavilion on a Friday night and televise it. That would show at 10 o'clock on Saturday morning. We'd do Edmonton on Saturday night. And then we'd come back and do the uh, corral in the same uh, park as the uh, pavilion on Sunday. So it was a double shot in that area. So that our first night we're in the ring against the champions, and we get, we get DQ'd and we're beating them up and they were bloodied and that. Next minute, these kids are thrown in the ring. Four of them, two of them were bleeding. And then, and the guy at the outside was yelling out, "Beat him up, champ! Beat him up, champ!" And that man was Abdullah. <laughs> <laughs> So we'd already met, we'd already known Matt Abdullah. He'd been down New Zealand, too. You know, where he'd been in Australia for Jim Barnett. Jim Barnett had all the heavy artillery down there. He had the Golden Boys, you know, like Rick Martel and Don Morocco and, the, and Bruno. But the, the, the main, the main um, heels, he had heavy artillery. And Abdullah was one of them. Yeah, with that, yeah, I mean... And so we left the ring. And now there's six guys laying in the ring. And uh, we walk back, and there's this short, this guy about 5'10", very thick, about 270 pounds, thick in the hips. And as we go past him, he says, guys, what are you doing out there? They're my kids. <laughs> uh, they're my kids. And, that, and the way he talked, then I realized, because I've been told since... The two days I was there, I arrived the day before, but I never worked. But I told, when you meet Stewie, er, 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 and, you know, he talks, and he spaces his words. You know, it's not a flow. He stutters, sort of not stutters, but talks slow. You know what I mean? He said, er, 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 what, what the F are you doing? They're my boys. You know? And, and when I, I don't know whether one of them was Brett. Uh, pardon me, Owen was too small at the time. Brett was only about 30 or 14 at the time, and there was the other kids in the family. You know, Stu had eight eight boys and four girls. Yeah. There was, only, there was only two of them, or three of them wrestling, and there was a big gap to Brett. You know, the other ones were 18 and 19, and then, the, then there was the gap coming down to 14 where Brett was. And that, so uh, we worked for Stu Hart for a year and a half there. Uh, that uh, when you came up with the sheep herders? No, we were we were the crazy kiwis. Crazy kiwis, okay. Crazy kiwis, and, and 60, 19, 1966, 1976, we got a call from New Zealand, the promoter Jim. Um, Steve Rickard wanted us to go home. Television started in 67 there, and um, now he's got, um, they're going to take the first television shows in New Zealand, a series. The first series were 13, and then they were going to look at that and go from there. So he wanted us to come home for the first series and that. So we flew home back to New Zealand, and that for On The Mat, that was the that was what wrestling was called in New Zealand. 
with Steve Rickard and Ernie Leonard on the mat. Nice. So we bent you oh. back to New Zealand, uh-huh. and that and um, and the territory was running then. We had te- television, and then I don't know what happened. Ah, uh, something something happened to that. Whether we fell out or or the or um, American wrestlers left. They, 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 their time was up with work permits, and they all left, and the business went down. You know. When he brought us back, instead of bringing us back, because we had good write-ups and newspapers and all that from Canada, that um, he brought us back as the bad guys instead of bringing the two local boys back as heroes. He brought us back as the villains, of course. And then that, because the New Zealand promoter was the good guy. You know what I mean? He didn't want anyone to take take uh, take over the uh, glory. He wanted to still be the kingpin. Makes sense. And he was re- and he was getting older and not moving around. Huh? You know, he, he'd blow up after five minutes. And, and Butch and me were like two pit bulls. You know what I mean? Oh, well, definitely. So, so yeah, I, I think about uh, ninety uh, seventy seven. Butch opened up a business there. Bought, bought us like a Seven Eleven, uh, a place like that. And got you know, and people working for him, and um, and I w- I was in the nightclub business. My my uh, partner that I was with before, he had, now he's got two clubs. So um, I went into one club with him, you know, the, uh, you know, fifty fifty with him, and a night another nightclub and that, and um, and I just did tours. And I went to Australia for tours, but the promotion now after the American promoter had left in seventy two, the buildings were packed before. Now they're only, they've got the fences down halfway, the big coliseums and everything. They've got the curtains down halfway and they're only getting about, you know, 6,000 people. And, and the buildings were they getting 15,000 before. It was sad. But I, I was doing there and, Austria, and Japan. So I kept in the business. And then in 79, early 79, itchy feet and away we went. Cubes with uh, Rick Martel and Rob the tag titles. Yeah, we moved. We moved up to um, to um, Hawaii. New Zealand promoted bought Hawaii, and he moved with a whole whole crew up there. Yeah, a whole crew up there was Rick Martel, but all the, the before there was Mark Lewin and uh, and um, you know uh, King Curtis, big names, Don Morocco, the only guy who left who had a big name, you know, in that, in that era in New Zealand was uh, Rick Martel. But, he, but they bought a lot of French, French Canadians and Rick Martel bought a lot of French Canadians. And, but the territory the territory didn't take off. It, the guy that sold, sold it to him was Ed Francis. Now, Russ Francis played in the NFL. I think he played for the 49ers. That sounds correct. I, I believe you're right on that. Yeah, the history. Now, I'm now I'm in Hawaii. I'm in the dressing room. Ed Francis, Steve Rickard has taken over there, but Ed Francis is there, you know, monitoring, helping uh, Steve Rickard take over, you know, and he's still helping him in the towns because Steve didn't have all the relationship with all the people involved in t- in the television and in the. Uh, and all the other stuff, you know, advertising world and that. Anyhow, I'm in the dressing room watching the 49ers play. This guy catches the ball, runs over the line. It's a touchdown. Next minute, he's in a phone box because they didn't have uh, laptops. They didn't have pads then, you know, um, you know, um, digital pads. And... uh, or uh, phones and that, uh, what they call um, cell phones. He's in a phone box, and he's. I guess he's talking up. I didn't know what he was doing, but he was talking up to the the uh, coordinator in the stands. I didn't know. I didn't know this go on. And he had his hand in a bucket of ice. And then I look. I looked at Butch, 
And I said, look, and now I'm really knocking the American football. I said to the boys in the room, because there's only Butcher Me and Kiwis there. And all the rest are Americans or Canadians. We said, look at this fucker. Look at this effing pussy. He's, <laughs> he's on the field for five, about three minutes because he just came on. He caught the ball, went over the line. Now he's got his hand in a bucket of ice and he's on the phone talking up. And I said, look at him. And he's talking to mummy. <laughs> <laughs> and that mummy. Now Ed Francis is in there. That was Russ Francis who, was, who just scored. <laughs> what a coincidence, huh? Yeah, what, what a coincidence. Exactly. Yeah, what all, the boys, all the boys were going uh, 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 and pointing at, at, the, um, at Ed Francis. And I didn't know what they were meaning. You know what I mean? I didn't know who Ed Francis was at the time. Uh-huh. I didn't know that it was that was his son. Because Ed Francis had run Hawaii for about 20 years. And it was when he had the business, he had all the big stars there. You know? who went to Madison, from Madison Square Garden and San Francisco and Los Angeles. He had all those stars. And that so it, that place was rocking and rolling. When we were there, we lasted about three months or two months. It was it was great, but we just kept our heads above water. We're on the beach every day. The gym at 8 o'clock in the morning, on the beach every day to 5, and a plane at 6. To, the, to an island, 7:30 show, 9:30 back in the plane and back to the and back to um, Waikiki, flying over Diamond Head and seeing them do Hawaii Five O. <laughs> that was that was five nights a week. Sounds like good times. Yeah, but not making any money, mate. Keeping our heads above water. So at some point. So at some point, that seemed like it was too uh, too much for Butch, and he decided that he wanted to leave. You ended up getting... No, 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 we're not even there yet, mate. That's okay. Been... <clears throat> we're at a big show there now at Pearl Harbor. You're American, so you know what Pearl Harbor is. <laughs> yeah. A New Zealander wouldn't know who, what Pearl Harbor was and what happened there. You know, anyhow, um, we're at a big show in Pearl Harbor, and... Buddy Rose and Roddy Piper and, uh, you know, a couple of guys from the West Coast came in. And Roddy Piper said to us, he saw us work. He said to us, Jesus, Don Owens, who owns Pacific Northwest, needs a heel tag team. And that I'm going to go and ring him now and tell him, because we told him we want to get out of there. He said, Hawaii, we want to get out of the place. So Roddy went and made the phone call. We'd only just met him. About two hours before, he went and made the phone call, and that called Don Owens. He said, I'm going to get the guys to come over to the phone. And that, so he cut up, got us. We went over the phone and um, talked to him. And uh, we said we had a Japan trip. And um, he booked us. And he book, and he said, can you come on such and such? And that next minute, we went to the Japan, did our tour there. They came back and started in Pacific Northwest Wrestling, which ran from the top of California to Vancouver, Canada. So it sounds like uh, Piper was a pretty good guy to, to vouch for you like that. Yes. Now, this little territory, this little territory called Pacific Northwest, when we come in there, there's cowboys. These are all the guys who went to run, to, who went to WWE. I got Rick Martell to come in. He realized the island wasn't going to do any good, so he come over there, too. I got I called him up and got him to come over. And, and that and he teamed up with Roddy Piper. There was Cowboy Ron Bass. There, Jesse Ventura was coming in and out. There was uh, Jimmy Snooker just left. Uh, uh, Buddy Rose, who went to WWF. There was me and Butch, who went to WWF. Who else? There was someone else. But the whole territory had great talent there. Great talent. And that, there was Stan, uh, there was Stan Stasek who had already worked in the, and won the belt in Madison Square Gardens. Or Bruno, he was there. It was a hell of a crew. And anyhow, we worked there. We lasted there about a, a year and a half. How about that? Was it- I mean, then, that was then, pr- we, 
then then we uh, that promoter was very close to the Crockett's NWA out of the, out of Charlotte, uh, North Carolina. Don Owens had know, known the dad of uh, the Crockett's for years, and now he was dealing with the son. He'd sent Jimmy Snooker down there, and now he he sent us down to Charlotte, and that. And um, now we're in the one of the biggest territories in North in North America at the time, Charlotte. Charlotte. It's running two towns a night, and it's booming. They've done a big thing with with uh, Rick Flair and um, Black Jack Mulligan. So the place is on fire. Even the other towns are on fire. All uh, a lot of the workers had worked in Madison Square Garden were there. Big the Hammer, Valentine, Jimmy Stu. Right, the names go on and on and on. You know, who, who worked it? Who worked in the gardens and that? The territory was loaded. Anyhow, we started working, and that and um, there. The second week, they put the belts on us, and that not the main world championship. They put us. They put the uh, Mid Atlantic belts on. They were known as the pacifiers. You put the belts on them, and you, they keep the guys happy, and you don't pay them as much as the world champions. <laughs> How about that, mate? Yeah, that ain't... Pacifier belts. And, that uh, we were, and we were working in the second town, you know, we, there'd be a single main, and we'd be one of the other mains, or, or one, one down one match. And that, uh, now the other guys who were the world champions working in the other town, they were making about $1,000, $1,500 a week more than us. I didn't know that at the time, you know, because all of a sudden I went from a smaller territory, Pacific Northwest, and now I'm in big time, you know, much bigger than WWF at the time, WWWF. Because Vince Senior only owned three towns, but he sold his talent out over a big area, you know what I mean? Bolton, I know what you mean. All, yeah. all the different guys, promoters owned different towns, and he sold the talent to them. Because his television went in to all those towns. And then uh, the Crockett's ran North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Virginia, West Virginia. That's how much they were running when we first went in there. They were running all those states. And that you were in a car. All those, you didn't, all you did was um, work in an arena get back to the hotel or where you stayed, and then you um, slept, got up early, stuffed down to some breakfast, went to the gym, come over from the gym, showered, stuffed some food, hopped in the car, and drove for the town. You know, some towns were 250, uh, 250 miles, 300 miles away. Other towns were 150 miles away. And you'd work that town one night, and then... 200 miles away, and then you'd work 300 miles away from your home the next day. So you have to drive back, get home, and then get up early the next day and head out. That's that's when um, we got we 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 were there, say six months, and that and uh, we still had the belts, and that and uh, I went. I got a call from a friend who was in New, in New Zealand with us, a French guy. Well, Frenchy Martin, he worked in WWF as the uh, manager of... Um, Pino Bravo. Pino Bravo, you got it, mate. Frenchy Martin, yes. And uh, he got, he, and he was actually working, too, in the, in the ring, but he was the manager there, too, later on, of Pino. Yeah. And he called us, he says, we only work in three days a week. Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, twice on Sunday, and he told us how much we could make, and that was that was as much as we were making, if not more, than I was making on the road, seven days a week, doing 3,500 miles a week. Oh wow! And so, and the island of Puerto Rico is only a hundred miles by 30 miles, but it's congested. There's four million people there. And they were real wrestling fans. Yeah, I was going to say, I've always heard that. That's when we came in there. We came in there with a hot start. The promoter was in the lobby doing a signing, 
and we came, instead of going to the dress rooms at the back, we came in and parking out the back. We came in through the front door. We had a New Zealand flag on a on steam pipe. We split it in half. It had a knot. It had a thing where you could join it in the middle, split it, and we beat him with the pipe to a bloody mess, and the ambulance come and took him out. This was our first night there. And, boy, we got some steam off that. And um, we were... That was he. He knew how to promote us and get us over fast, because he was the main guy. And that night we were supposed to work against him and another guy, the Invader one. And um, Invader had to go out by himself. And then, uh, right during the middle of the match, they did the Spirit of '76. You know, Bruf, Bruford Prosser. Remember the movie Bruford, The Walking Tall. Yeah. Yeah, he came, he came back in the doors into the arena, drove in, and an ambulance, getting tr- driven in with an ambulance, got an ambulance all bandaged up with blood coming through the bandage, and then with a, with a baseball bat, came in the ring and started giving us some stick with the stick. We, of course, we got out before he really gave us the fucking heavy beating. That was our introduction to Puerto Rico. It was really blood and guts. And that's when Butch, after being there about two months, Butch got the call from his wife. She was wanting to, you know, she says, uh, she was over with us in, in, in um, uh, she was over with us in Canada in the early 70s. And then when we were in 79, 80 in Portland, Oregon, she was over with the two kids and that. And then she hadn't been there to Butch. And so that was when Butch said, well, he packed his bags and left. So that's left around... His poor, left, left, left this poor little Kiwi by himself. Yeah. Well, fortunately, I understand you were good at finding uh, partners. Like you found uh, Jonathan Boyd? Yes, and Jonathan Boyd had been in the States. I'd known him from the 60s. He's an Aussie. And he, him and Norman Charles III, the guy that I got the gimmick from a being a fag, and that they were partners. They were Lord Jonathan Boyd and um, Lord Jonathan Boyd and Sir Norman Charles the Third, and they were a tag called, called the Royal Kangaroos, and they had a big run in the South, not so much in the North. Well, they did the North Pacific Northwest, but not up, not up Central America or on the East Coast. But in the South, they had a big run all over the South. And now they were split up. And, and, and Jonathan was back in back in Oregon, his home. So I called, you know, I, I, I'd i seen him when I was in Oregon. So I called him up. And I wanted to get a guy with the, the accent, you know, the down under accent. And oh, that I got part. Jonathan to come down to Puerto Rico. And um, that was the start of, of the new sheep herders. Definitely. And then with that, I understand that uh, it caused you to, you fought the invaders, but after the invaders, you ended up uh, eventually meeting up with the fabulous ones. And that was probably one of the highlights of your career, is those intense feuds. Yeah, well, when Jonathan came in, into Puerto Rico, um, Jonathan was was only about 5'8", five 5'7". Five but he was thick, about 230, you know, that's mm-hmm. why we're very sick. And that and and um he had had a run in with the guy, the invader one somewhere in the somewhere in the States. Invader worked in the States and he had a run in and Invader was in the office. So Jonathan came and joined up with us and after a month or so they couldn't deal with Jonathan. Jonathan in the ring he had the, in Australia we had to put the Americans over. In short time, four minutes, five minutes, you know what I mean, in the ring. Because they were the big stars. Now, him over in, in North America and Puerto Rico, he, he, he his attitude was different. He beat up all the Americans he could. In the ring, he was hard to work with. God bless him. But he had a he was heavy on in the interview. Heavy. Country wise, he was the best. Nice. He was nasty. Hey, the fans didn't like him. But even the boys in the dressing room didn't like him because he was so nasty. 
<laughs> so if the boys in the dressing room don't like it, you know the fans really hate you. Exactly. Yeah, I was going to say that. So we we left there and we went we we let, went a short time in Florida. Dory Funk was booking Florida at the time, and we went to Florida had a had a, a, a short run there. He was leaving to go to Japan, and the territory was on fire. So he's bringing everyone in before he left, and that and and that and then after that, after that, we went to the uh, we had a short run there because they changed Booker, and Dory went to Florida, and the new Booker brought his own crew in. Usually, Bookers take their own crews with them. You know, if they have a good crew that's drawing. They fire everyone that was there, or except the main one star or two, and they bring in their own crew. You understand what I'm saying? I know what you mean. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so so we were, when the new booker came in, we weren't involved in that. And um, so we went to work for the Fullers, Continental Wrestling. It was run out of Pensacola. It, did, it went right up, um, uh, shit. Up to Birmingham, Alabama. It, go, it went from right down to Mobile, up to Birmingham, and across the panhandle of Florida, over to Tallahassee. And you ran, and you ran now and again, you'd run, run uh, what's it called now? Panama, Panama uh-huh. City. Yeah, Panama. The panhandle up there, and you'd run a few spot shows. And you'd do the TV every morning. And Dolphin at nine o'clock, which was showed at eleven or ten or midday, midday that Saturday. And you did Dolphin Arena in the, in the big barn that night. It held about three thousand. That was that territory. And that we had one hell of a run there. That's where I met. Well, I met Joe Luduk before in Canada, and that. But that's where I it teamed up with Joe Luduk, Jonathan, me. We had our own army there, and um. And I was living with Joe LeDuc. We had a big house on the wall nice. there. Yeah, that oh. was good times. Small territory. There's only one long trip, which was which was 220 miles, it was from Pensacola to uh, to Birmingham. It was mainly up 65, one highway, and then about 20 or 20, 30 minutes on a small one cutting across off the highway. Because that highway went down to Mobile, and you cut across to Pensacola. But that was a good little territory. You know, every day on the beach, more or less, that was the only long trip, Birmingham. Yeah, I was going to say, it sounds like you really like that area. And is that why you end up settling in Florida uh, currently? No, I, no, I, I, yeah, I love that area. But still, you get the winters there. It get cold or frosty in the winter. And, you know, we had a winter there and free, it froze. All the pipes froze and all that. The uh, plastic pipes all froze. And that, uh, that, um, we, uh, that's when I left there and went to Jerry Jarrett's territory then. And that's where we had the big run with the fabulous ones. Oh, big, massive run. Massive run for about six months, nonstop, with them every night. All over. It was a big area. It was Tennessee, which is quite a big state, and you would go down into Mississippi a bit, and also we'd go up into um, Kentucky. Nice. Louisville, Lexington. So, yeah, shoot. Uh, and a few uh, other towns, smaller towns, but there were the two, mount- two main t- towns we did. Uh, with Louisville, we did every... Um, Tuesday night. Memphis was always Monday night. And that would have been uh, Jim Crockett, or not Jim Crockett, uh, Jim Cornette, uh, probably when he Jim was... Jim Cornette uh, was a photographer. When we got there, Jim Cornette was a photographer, and then with, while we were there, he became the man. He must have been grooming because he became the manager of Adrian Street. Yeah, Adrian Street was a British guy who was big on the wide world of sport in the 60s and 70s. And that, you know, now he come up, he started in the late 60s or mid 60s, and now he was over in the States. He had a big run in the States. 
and uh, the territory was, the territory had a lot of good talent there. Of course, Jerry Lawler just worked Memphis. You know, he owned a third of the town, so he just worked Memphis there. But we worked the whole territory with the Memphis ones. And of course, every we had a hot we had a hot situation where everywhere was selling out or three quarters to sell out. Exactly. I was going to say that was Everywhere. one of the one of the most you know, heated rivals in uh, professional wrestling, tag team wise. I would say uh, the Sheep Herders and the Fabulous Ones would be right up there uh, with the Midnight Express and the Rock and Roll Express. Yeah. Would that be fair? Yes. Yes. House was, and then and um, and later on, I become Booker in territories. So I took the Fabulous Ones. Bought the fabulous ones in wherever I booked and had a run with them there too. I'd bring them in for weekend shows or for a week and have a run with them because, you know, we were magic. Together, them and us, we were magic. I'd run videos, get video strip trips from the Jarrett. Jarrett and uh, uh, Gary Jarrett and Jerry Law were the first to do videos on talent, music videos. Oh, nice. They started doing them around 1980. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, Jerry. Fargo, Jackie Fargo was the guy behind the fabulous ones to get them started. He he, he toured around the, the uh, territory with them for a while, not while we were there, but when they came in to get them over. You know what I mean? When Jared put them together and built them to, as a team, they did a lot of videos and um, all the house shows. The uh, Fargo was a superstar in all that area for years and years. Yeah, he definitely didn't get the credit he deserved uh, yeah. with, with modern fans. Yeah, they were there with modern fans. No, they didn't know about it. But the Fargo before that, the Fargo brothers. You know, they were wild. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Anyhow, we had that massive run. And after that, that's when we got, got, got a call. They said there's territories down, and they said you guys could pull it out, pull it out of the out of the hole. And that was um, Southwest Championship Wrestling, and it was owned by a grappler from the fifties and sixties, Joe Blanchard, father oh. of Tully Blanchard. The yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Tolly's dad and uh, Tess's grandpa, yeah. Who, who did you say? Tessa, uh, Tessa Blanchard, his, his granddaughter. She now yes, wrestles. Yes, yes, Tessa Blanchard, yeah. And then and they, they, they bought in. Tully was, Tully was sort of running and doing the book at the time, and they bought me in after a month. They, um, you know, I was suggesting stuff all the time to do. And they gave me the book. Nice. Yeah, so that was my first experience in '83 of writing television and, and booking talent, and um, and running the you know the promoter, the wrestling promoter runs the front of the house, does all the advertising, promotion, books the arenas, and does all that stuff, you know, and works for the television station. The the booker does writes the television every week books the talent and runs the, runs the back of the house, the matches and all that. That was, that was, my, first, that was my first gig as, as, a, as a, um, a booker. It definitely. Heavy is the head that wears the crown, it sounds like. Yeah. And uh, we just, and we'd only been there, but Jonathan and me, I got it after a month. Now we're, the sixth week, we're doing a heavy angle. Doing a, you know, an angle is a, a story where you, you, you do to attract attention mm -hmm. and to build a storyline. You call that an angle. Exactly. And you, do you understand? Or you, you've seen angles on television. With oh, definitely, yeah. I mean, yeah, shoot. Yeah, yeah. So we've mm -hmm. got a big angle on that. On this Monday night... What we usually do when we enter the territory, we had a map of the map of the territory we were in, you know, the promotion territory we're in, and we would 
Jonathan was a great talker about knocking the people, you know what I mean, and knocking Americans. He was he was nasty. He got vicious when he talked about that. You'd want to get up and slap him if you're an American. And um, in the end, we would do it. We would do a, um, a promo in the in the loo with a map of the territory and tell him that this state is is the latrine of North America. <laughs> and I have the New Zealand flag, and I would push the map down the toilet with the New, with the New Zealand flag and stand there holding that flag, you know, with, with, with the state down the toilet, and I'd flush the toilet. So it sounds, so it sounds like and Jonathan that, was like a, a Don Rickles-type character. Yeah, so we got, we got this all set up for the Monday night. Friday uh, for Monday night. Sunday afternoon, we do Austin. Austin, Texas is 50 minutes out of um, San Antonio, an hour out of San Antonio. We get back after the afternoon show. Jonathan used to knock back a dozen beer and a bottle of vodka. He'd drink a bottle of vodka a night with a half a dozen beer every night. But in the ring, he, he was... He was a machine in the ring. <laughs> he didn't stop, you know what I mean? If he got his hands on you, you wouldn't be able to tag your partner. <laughs> exactly, he'd yeah. he'd want to beat you up. <laughs> Anyhow, um, that night he, we got back, he drank and that, and then he called up a girl he was seeing, and then he called up this girl he was seeing, and he said, I'm coming over. And I said, excuse me a minute, excuse me. Uh, that's edit time. That's edit time, mate. Uh-huh. No worries. <laughs> and, and anyhow, um, he, he let, we, were, <clears throat> we were in little apartments at, down, down by a gym. Apartments, at a, like hotel apartments. And then he took off. And about um, 50 yards, there was a, a bend. Now, this was a Sunday afternoon, at 6 o'clock at night, and it was in the middle of summer, and the roads had been sweating. The tar seal had sweated, you know what I mean? Yeah. And he had been drinking. He went to go around the corner, and on the corner, there was a, there was like, it was, it was a, a built-up corner, and then he could slide down the hill, and there was a big post there. He didn't make the corner go around. He went off the road and hit that lamppost. He, he, I, I looked for him and looked for him and that. Found he was in hospital. He'd broken his hip, his back. He was in a bodysuit from the waist down below his knee. Ooh. He, he, he couldn't. He, he, uh, he couldn't sit up. He, lay, you know, lay down. He was, he was locked. I, he, I guess he could. Let me think. He, so well, he, was, he, he was in a cast from his waist down. So that's when he ended up getting uh, Bobby Jaggers, right? <clears throat> that's when I got Bobby. I did the. I did an angle. I, I got Bobby Jaggers as a tag team partner, and that we started working together. And then about a, a month later. We did a, we did something. We're a split. We're a, in a match. We're working with two. I think it was um, Cowboy Scott Casey and someone else, and Ken Luger. Luger. Ken, um, someone. Ken. I'm trying to think of his name now. Anyhow, um, we did something in a match, the first time, and we forgive each other. I, he forgive me, and the next time I did it, did it in that. And um, he fucked up, and um, we did so. We did something where the promoter booked us against each other, and um, in the match, in the match, I guess I blinded him, and then I went up to put a chair in the ring, his arm over the chair, went up the pole, went up the pole, and came off with a flagpole on his arm, and of course the, the damage, and uh, the hospital job, and all that sort of shit. 
Joe Blanchard came in the ring saying, you can't do this. I kept doing beating them up. And that, and Joe Blanchard was semi-crippled. One hip was gone. So he dragged that side. He came up on the ringside, got up onto the ringside. And I pulled him through the ropes, dragged him in the wing, and, and did the same to him. Whacked him over the head. And that was blood and all that sort of stuff. And then Tully came into the ring. And um, I ran off. And then hence we started the program with Tully and me. So um, after that, that is that, my, uh, that was that was my thing was and that and we ran with that from normal matches and then we went to we went on to um, no DQ matches and then boot camp matches and then we went to uh, um, cage matches. Over that period of time, now we're about six months into the six weeks into the program, seven weeks into the program, and I've been talking to Butch on the phone. Butch wants to come back. This is this is late '83, which and I said it's just the right time. So we were in we we're in Houston or, or Beaumont, Beaumont, Texas. You know, I'd, I'd taken Butch with me. He flew in on a Saturday, and I'd taken Butch to the show with me. And um, we had cameras there at the show, just one camera, handheld camera, and that, and Tully's got the best of me, and Butch opens the cage up from outside. No one knew who Butch was. He comes in and and um, and does the damage on Tully, and we left him laying there. Hence, Tully, Tully got, now he got Captain Redneck as a partner. Dick Murdoch who was well known of TBS television, Ted Turner's network. He'd worked huh? in Madison Square Garden. He'd worked everywhere around the country. Captain Regmat, Dick Murdoch, Red. a real yep. southern boy, a real Texas. Nobody, six foot four, but as strong as an ox. Buggy whip arms, but he was strong. And the people in Texas, they all knew him. He'd worked over Texas, in and out of Texas, because it was, it was his home territory for the last 20 years. 15 years so Tully got him as a partner and Butch and me and then we set off doing tags and that was my run in Texas you know yeah I was going to say it sounds like that would have been a huge feud and would have drawn really well with uh, the likes of the four of you yes yeah we had sell out matches sell out places especially Austin and San Antonio and down the valley too the, down on the valley on the border Westaco and and I'm thinking of other towns on the valley. I can't think of their names at the moment. They, we we work in in the would work in the fields outside the stadium. You know, in the ballparks outside the stadium, because right on the valley there, you've got all the fruit pickers, all the Mexicans, and of course, I'd bring Mil Mascarison. You know, the t Mil Mascarison, the notorious. Mexican wrestler who was a movie star in, in Mexico. Yeah. Yeah, I'd bring him in to make sure we sold out all these events. I'd bring him in for Friday, Saturday, and Sunday for Mexico City. And, um, of course, we, we'd, do, uh, we'd do Austin on a Saturday night. Sunday afternoon, we'd do in the valley. We'd do down one of those towns in the valley, McCullum or Westaco. And then Sunday night, we'd... We'd, we'd have another crew back in, in San Antonio and um, we'd have a little charter plane and we'd fly, the four of us would fly back, the main eventers would fly back to um, to um, San Antonio and we'd be in the Hemisphere Coliseum Saturday, uh, Sunday night. So we'd get, you know, Friday night, Saturday, and two shows on Sunday. Sounds like it was never uh, never slow. No, all these territories I'm talking about were seven days a week. A lot of them were twice on Sunday. Yeah. So, so that, for, was, uh -huh. that was that was Texas, and then I got the call. I I did a big angle with Abdullah and Carlos Cologne and that, and I set it up in Texas for Puerto Rico, and that's when I got the booking job down in Puerto Rico, and that's when I went down there and started booking. In 84, late 84, I went down the booking in Puerto Rico for WCW. 
Yeah. And for WWC, World Wrestling Council, or, or um, that's what it was called. Yeah, I was going to say, anytime I hear about booking in Puerto Rico, I always think of uh, Dutch Mantel, because didn't he at some point get down there, or would, would that have been after yours, your run? No, Dutch, Dutch Mantel was down there in the 70s. He came in there when Carlos opened the place with Grilla Monsoon in the in seventy five, and that he had he had a partner, a Yugoslavian partner, but he brought in Grilla Monsoon and that, and I think Grilla Monsoon had ten percent. You know who used to be on WWE TV, Grilla Monsoon? Oh yes, yeah, President Grilla Monsoon, yeah, because yeah, yeah, and, oh. that, and um, that that territory is hot, and in the seventies. Uh, Wayne Ferris, he, he was punk rock Wayne Ferris then, but of course he was the honky tonk man in WWF <laughs> for many years, um, and who's still a good friend of mine who I talk to regularly. Uh, he, him and him and Dutch were down there as a tag team in the seventies, and it was wild and woolly. Nice. Yeah, so um, Dutch had been there. And, and then I was a booker. Uh, I was a booker there in '83. I don't. A Dutch hadn't been there booking there yet. He'd worked there, and then and um, and after I left, another guy booked, and then Dutch came in and he booked there for a, uh, quite a while. He booked there. He was a booker there till Brody's death. So I'm guessing not much longer after that, you. Uh, that's when you started working for the Mighty Caesar. Yeah, yeah, we were working. No, no, we came back, you know, and I worked there for about there, and then I went to went to, then I got offered a good job by Billy Dundee. Billy Dundee was running um, UWF, the Mid South Arena for Mid South for Bill Watts. Now this was a big territory too. It went from New Orleans to St. Louis. Look at that ground there. <laughs> All those states in between that, he ran, he, he ran all that space and right across to Texas. He didn't run Florida. He ran, uh, he ran all the rest. And I went to work for him, and that, and um, that's when I had the big run. Well, the, and the story was, Billy was going back to, uh, he was a booker there. He was going back to work for Jarrett because he was a booker there when I worked. Uh, when I worked uh, for Jerry Jarrett, with the fabulous ones, he was the booker. And um, they said, you know, you want to come and book here? And I said, yeah. So I came there, and at the time, and put in when, when Bill left, it was a, a couple of months before I could come because I had these other the angles running and that, and I was in a major angle too with the um, Invaders and then with Carlos that I, I stayed there for another two months, and they put Dick, Dickie Slater as booker in um, in um, Mid-South, UWF, Universal Racing Federation. And um, when I got there, they said, we're not going to fire him. We're just going to keep him on as talent. And I'd known Dickie from Florida before. I'd known him. And um, usually when you bring another booker in, you get you, you, you relieve the other booker because he could do things against you. You don't understand what I'm saying about? I know what you mean, yeah. Yeah, so they they, they kept asking me to be booker. And I says, I can't, I, I, you know, I says, Dickie, and they wanted and they wanted Dickie to stay there. And then, and, and, you know, I, I didn't say fire him. I said, I'm not going to be booker. So we were the main tag team there, and we were doing this run with the Fantastics. You know, two little guys with big hearts, 205, 210 pounds, you know, 5'8", but big hearts and good fighters. We got them to become great fighters. And this was a big run we had with them. Yeah, Bobby actually uh, lives not too far from where I live. Yeah. Yeah, we had a massive, a massive run, a massive run with them, and that of course, well, the, the big Crockett Cup in 1986 in the Superdome. We went all the way to we got to the set, the set, semi-final match. We were those them and us with the count out. There was only one match after us. That was um, 
the, the, the road warriors and the Russians. And that, but that was a big highlight. The five star, they, it's on all the YouTube channels and that. We got a five star rating for that match. One of the tag, tag matches of the year, they said. Oh, yeah, that Crockett Cup was, I mean, just so uh, crammed with such talent. Like you said, yourselves and, and the Fantastics and the... Um, the Rock and Roll Express. Exactly. The Guerreros. There was the, in the tag, the tag, the tag teams were unreal from all over the country. There was tag teams from AWA. There was tag teams everywhere from around the country. And that's, except, except Vince Senior. Yeah, he was the only one who didn't want to play with others. <laughs> yeah, anyhow, we had this run with the fabulous ones, and then we went into, you know, we did all, all kinds of matches, all kinds of matches, boot camp matches, cage matches, blah, blah, matches, all crazy matches, and then we ended up in barbed wire cage matches. They built a cage that went around the ring of wood and was bolted on the corner post, and they uh, bolted on the corner post, and it had from, the, from post to post, it had a frame, but it was barbed wire all around it. The frame was around the top mm-hmm. and around the bottom, and it had one one board or one beam or, or a pipe or something going horizontal on each square that they put up because there's two squares for each side, and that and it was all barbed wire, and that and we started these barbed wire matches. Now, I never took the book. Going back and dropping back a bit, because I never took the book, he bought in Ken Mantell from from um, World Cast Wrestling. He was a booker in World Cast Wrestling. He was never a wrestler. His brother was, Johnny mm-hmm. Mantell. Yeah. And yeah, they bought Kenny Mantell in as booker, and of course, he bought his own guys in. He bought in the... Um, uh, the Freebirds, and that, and and um, he got, he had some other team working with the Freebirds, but we were still working the Fantastics. We were last match each night in the um in, in this blood uh, these blood baths and that. I think we did about thirty of them. I'm not sure, but we did a lot of them, and that's maybe twenty five, thirty, and that, and um, actually. I got a paycheck, and I said, after a while, I said, look, look at the houses. And, and, and I heard how much the Freebirds were making. They were making a, about a half a grand or nearly a grand more than us. And your matches were way more they intense and way more over, yeah. They were the Booker's boys, you know what I mean? Uh, yeah, I know what you mean. And, that, and we were the last match. So I said to Butch, I got the check. I said, I'm not going to work that. Not tonight. So we never went to work that night. Next morning, we get a phone call and that and um, blah, blah, blah. It was not Bill Watts, but it's um, it's Grizzly Smith and then it's JR. JR was his, JR was his right-hand man too. Oh, nice. And that and um, JR, man, JR was his, his main guy doing the voiceovers on his television. He had a good television show. Very good. And uh, and um, I got a call from him, and they offered us before each night, they said, we'll give you a 500 retainer, retainer before you go to the ring every night. Now, you know, that's 3500 a week, right? Yeah. That's seven nights a week. And then... We knew as soon as this, soon as uh, we finished, as soon as they we finished this run with the fa- Fantastics, you know, we get fired. You understand? We knew that only given us that, then they cut us right off. Yeah. And we said, "Fuck them! They fucked us. They effed us all that time. Well, here we are effing them." So um, that's when we came back to Florida Championship Wrestling, which the Crockett's had bought out, and that and. And all all that time, I, when it was when we left and went from Crocus to Puerto Rico in seventy um, seventy one, Jim Crockett said, "I never I never take." He told the next booker, "I never take him back." 
and Dusty was a booker, and he'd come and work for me in Texas. And he said, I want you guys back. And then I spoke to him at that time. This is going back in, in 75, 70, uh, 85. And um, he says, Jim Crockett, I want you back. But when he bought out Florida, we were the champions there in Florida, and we we're running with the fabulous ones in Florida. So we, we, he, when he bought the company out, he had to take us. Yeah. And, and we we're only back with him a short time. Maybe we were finished up our run with the fabulous ones, and we started with the Rock and Roll Express, and um, bang, we got the call from Caesar. Nice. Yeah, I was going to say, I understand the uh, the first one to make contact with you was uh, Pat Patterson. Yeah, we're in the gym in Columbus. I was at the, the Gold's Gym in Columbus, Ohio. And Butch always worked on his drum. I never worked on my drum. You know, the drum is your core. Mm -hmm. I would, he'd do 20 minutes after he's finished on the weights on his core. I would do a bit of cardio. That was it. Anyhow, I right. um, go and go go, and I'm picking up. These days, the you, you worked on the phones. You called from you on the road. You called, got your answer phone, and then opened it up, put your pin in, and got your got your messages right. Yep. Got my message, and it says, "Pat here, can you give me a call?" And he says, uh, "He didn't. I didn't, he didn't say Pat Patterson. I think he said it's just Pat here." And even if he said Pat Patterson, it wouldn't dawn on me straight away it was the Pat Patterson. You know what I mean? It wouldn't yeah. have dawned on me. Anyhow, <clears throat> what, I, what I do is I got my card, my uh, my box card. I could drive it, travel around the territory. You don't use coins. You have a card, you know, so you can call any time. So put put the card back in, pull this number. It's Pat. And he says, he says to me, I've got you on voice, um, speakerphone. And his voice says to me, G'day, Kiwi. <laughs> this is Vince McMahon. Nice. Of course, I've been sending tapes into Vince McMahon Sr. when it was Betamax. Now, Betamax was 1981, 82. I've been sending tapes to that office then, but at that time, they had all big guys there, you know, and so I've seen you had all big guys. Anyhow, um, I said tapes on later than that too. He said, "I'd like to like to ask you if you'd like to come up and work for me." This was seventy eight, mid seventy eight, yeah. And I said, oh, "I'd love to." You know, it's, that was the main place to go. You know what I'm saying? Yep. We'd see. I'd see the guys for you know in the airports. Because a lot of the Charlotte guys had gone up to Vince, you know. Exactly. Snooker, uh, um, um, Greg the Hammer, Valentine, and all that. And Ted DiBiase had left, and Axel Juggin had left, and that, that left us in, in Bill Watts' tour at UWF. And they were all working out there, and I'd see them on, on the uh, uh, in different airports who cross paths. So I said, yes, and he said, um, when can you come? I said to him, when do you want us to come? He says, no, I don't want you to break in. When do you have a day off? And I just said straight away, Wednesday. <laughs> and believe it or not, I don't know whether we had the day off or something happened. Anyhow, I said something about immigration to Crockett's office. Anyhow, Wednesday we flew up there, got picked up in, in um, LaGuardia. Straight up to the office in the limousine, sat outside, waited for Vince. Went and saw Vince, and he says to us, "What do you think of you guys being the good guys?" He says, "You've been bumping around, and and you you know your bodies are getting all hurt, and that I'd like you to be the good guys. You won't have to bump so much." And Butch got up on that desk and had his nose a foot away from Vince's nose, and you know Butch's nose is not small. Check yeah. out Vince's next time you see it. And he says, if you can make these faces, baby faces, go for it. And, nice. Vince, said, and Vince said, turn back, he says, well, look at the bloody mugs on my favorite, on my top baby faces. Look at Hulk Hogan. 
Look at Randy Savage. Look at Hacksaw Jim Duggan. <laughs> they're, not, you're not, they're not the prettiest faces. Exactly. And that, and of course, being a booker and the old style booker, I says, "Well, bring us in as heels and turn us and turn us uh, baby faces." He said, "That's not the way I do it. That's what I learned. You don't tell Caesar anything." Exactly. You know what I mean, I know what it's you his mean. His way or the highway. Exactly, and it sounds like. Uh, he was the main reason for the rebranding because he wanted uh, to own you uh, or own the yeah, name. So, so we get home two days later on the road, and then and um, oh, he says to us too, you know, I can put you on if you want to finish there. I'll put you on the payroll as soon as you finish there. Right? Uh-huh. So where we looked at each other, fuck, this is great, <laughs> this is great, and that so. Uh, we get back there, and that that last time we 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 gave Crockett six weeks. This time we gave Crockett a week, or two weeks, a week, and he wasn't he wasn't hot. He was hot, and that and um, and we headed up there. He, he what he said to us, he says, "I want to bring you up here once a week for four weeks and do videos, vignettes, vignettes." And yes, exactly. of course, there's a two minute from a, a two minute to three minute video a, a video of us telling a story. At the time, he, and we and then two days later, three days later, we get contracts in the mail. Bush rings me up. He says they sent us the wrong contract, Bushwhackers. And I says, hey, Vince wants to own their names because then it's the merchandise he has to give us a percent or something like that. Which was true. He gave us one percent between the two of us, so we got a half a percent each. Dang. Of the of, of the net. Yep. So yeah, we, we went mm-hmm. up in that, and we did these things. Yes. <clears throat> and at the time, Crocodile D was a hot item. Crocodile D two, and all these vignettes we did. You know, the Crocodile Dundee way. Mm-hmm. All of it. All of it. You know what I mean? Definitely. During the vignettes, uh, you worked a lot with Mean Gene. Did you kind of consider him the third bushwhacker? Yes, yes. Mate, mate, what a great man. Even doing interviews or anything, you know, do promos, and you get a little lost, he would come in and put you, and turn you right back in the right direction and feed you. He was, he was brilliant at what he did. And another guy we did them with was Lord Alfred Hayes. And another great professional. I mean, unfortunately, not all the people in the current generation of wrestling fans know about him and his great work that he did. No, no one, no one knows. Hey, mate, Terry Hulk tells me too uh, that, that you know, Orndorff, um, yep. a lot of the new generation. They know who they didn't know who Piper or Orndorff were, so they came in to do a thing. You know when when they did the when they did that 25th anniversary of Raw and that they had they had the um, Mr. T. They had names in there and that and um, these kids didn't even realize that WWF was it wouldn't be there because Vince had the vehicle, but he needed the talent to drive the vehicle. And all the talent were great guys at doing that. Definitely. Now, in in their defense, Orndorff looked extremely different when he came back at that event with the facial hair and all that. It did. It, it, it he looked so different. Who did? Orndorff. Didn't he have like uh, like long facial cancer. hair at that event? Yeah, well, he had was... cancer. You know, Paul oh. had major cancer. Oh, I did not know that. Nearly died. Nearly died. He's lucky one. He's really lean and all that. Yeah. He's yeah. sad. You know, I've, yeah. I've, I've been on shows with him and their signings, you know, um, conventions and all that, and it's yeah. sad, you know. Okay. It, it affected his mind a bit, too. Oh, jeez. Yeah, I didn't know that part Very forgetful. It. And that, but God bless him. He's alive. So uh, when when I think about the Bushwhackers, I always think about their Survivor Series. I always think that was 
one of the uh, most interesting times of your career. I know a lot of times people associate you with the Royal Rumble, but that's not for good reasons. I like thinking of you with the, the big turkey and teaming up with some of the different other legends. Uh, you teamed with uh, Roddy Piper and uh, Snuka. Give me as, Snuka. Yeah, as part of uh, part of a team. What was that team like? Very good. And now the other team had Kurt Henning on it. I think they may have had Rick Rude. I mm-hmm. forget who they had on it. But um, what are the Rujos? Uh, the Rujos, yes. Yeah, that was great, mate. Of course, Roddy. Buddy and Jimmy are great guys. God bless them. We all came from Portland, Oregon, <laughs> originally. Exactly. A nice reunion. I, I, I traveled with Jimmy when I was in, in Charlotte in 1981. Jimmy traveled with Jimmy all the time. Nice. And Roddy and it, traveled with Jimmy and Roddy. And Matt, and, if we're, because I'm running two towns. And we traveled with Roddy because Roddy came in to Charlotte about two months after we were there the first time. And I understand with him you get into some trouble from time to time. Yeah, he yeah. had crazy. Like, you know, like a lot of ribs, a lot of things happen. And I know, you know, it's bad, bad if I mention them on this sort of show. I know what you mean. And then uh, some of the other teams, of course, you teamed up as the Alliance one year. Yeah. Now, another one, another team, we were the Doinks. Yep, the Doinks with uh, Men on a Mission. Yes, the Doinks. And that was, they wrote that up as one of the worst tag matches ever seen. But they got a lot of write-ups to say how entertaining it was. Because I threw in a banana skin in the end. The, the, uh, one of the um, head triggers slipped on it and I covered him. <laughs> and then they all covered me. They all hopped up on me. Exactly. It felt more like a Three Stooges uh, show than a... Uh... It was a stacks on the mill. Yep. Yeah, some great times. One of the greater times for me, mate, it was two great ones. I could, lot of, I could go on a lot of stories at WWF. It would go on for hours. Um, here's a great, a great time going into where this is the last show in the old Wembley Stadium. It was built up for it was a built up Davy Boy against his brother-in-law Brett Hart. This was built properly. They took they took their time to build this. We're in Wembley Stadium, ninety-four thousand six hundred people. And you jerked the curtain. We're the we're the first match. We're the curtain jerkers, and now now you know at a stadium like that, some people have been there sitting in there for an hour and a half because it's to fill the stadium takes time. It's two hours. It's the first match. It was a six man tag: Axel, Jim Duggan, and the Bushwhackers against the Nasty Boys and the Mountie. Here we are with Jim Duggan. Whoa! <laughs> Whoa! We do whoa, and then Butch going yay, and and Duggan doing oh. Yeah, shoot, you probably didn't have to do too much rest. The the aura there was unreal. It's such a huge, uh, such a huge event. It sounds like I mean, with so many fans there, and then like you said, you guys were so over and just had the the crowd eating out of the palm of your hand. Yeah, and being the first match to open the night. The people are ready to go. You know, you understand what I'm saying? They were, they they they've been sitting there so long, most probably sipping on booze, and that now they're ready to open their lungs up and go. Now, uh, second, uh, second part, second one of my life, and this is in the '80s, uh-huh. a battle royal and MSG, Madison Square Garden, the mecca of entertainment. Mm-hmm. And that is a battle royal, and we're all in the ring. The last man in the ring to come into the battle royal is Hulk Hogan. When he, his music come on, and he come out, Butch could, Butch could have his head on my shoulder, hook into my ear, I wouldn't hear a word. You know, the hair stood on my arms. I'm not, and now I'm not lying about that. 
the, the feeling in there that that's when you know Hulkamania, WrestleMania in the in the eighties everything was it was wild. You know what I mean? Oh, definitely. Yeah, I was lucky enough to see him perform live about five five or six times, and it just was always such an amazing atmosphere. Yes, and he didn't have to do much, but what he did, the people were right behind him. I say so you've had uh, an amazing career in what was it, 2015, where you were honored by the Hall of Fame. Yeah, that was a that was a occasion. It was a, <laughs> I said to Vince, it was about bloody time. Uh-huh. You know, when we went to WWF, mate, the WWF, Facebook, and all the media, the wrestling media, say, what are those two jerks going to horror? The two clowns. They, they did, most of them didn't realize that we were the sheep herders. And that wasn't until the northern people, it wasn't, wasn't until I got up on the stage and told them that I'd wrestled um, Rock's grandfather in the 60s. Killer Kowalski had sold out Madison Square Garden in the 60s and 70s. I'd wrestled this. I'd wrestled Stu Hart, Matt's father. All these guys I'd wrestled. You know what I mean? They didn't, exactly. they, 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 they didn't know that we'd been wrestling since, um, that I'd been wrestling since 62. And it's exactly. amazing traveling from 66 onwards together. They didn't yeah, even know that. That was yeah, a big wake up. For them, yeah, they, you know, when, mm-hmm. What's that? Oh, I was going to say, yeah, they just knew about your uh, your time at the end of your career in the WWF, and yeah. where, where you had done so many more amazing things throughout your career, and that the uh, WWF was kind of the cherry on the Sunday. Exactly, mate. It was the cherry on the Sunday. It was the cream on the milk. Exactly. And then I understand during that ceremony, uh, several of your former uh, or longtime colleagues uh, actually got up and uh, did the Bushwhacker uh, march. Well, yes, we called. We um, that was the final part of it. It was Butch attempted to elect me. A few of them, which, between the things, we told some stories. Right, the, 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 we told some as well. To me, it was entertaining stories because everybody laughed, and that. And that we were short and sweet, about 10 minutes, I think, 12 minutes. The one before us was half an hour. <laughs> and then, and uh, so Vince said to us, go out and entertain the people. So we started, and then Bush went to grab me, and I pushed him away. And then finally, we did, we did the thing. We called up, uh, we, we, we brought up friends, Ted DiBiase, uh, Bret Hart, Scotty Piper, and Hacksaw Jim Nice. And then yeah. Hacksaw marched half the way. He said, fuck, I would have got more TV time if I marched all the way to the stage. He was sitting <laughs> right back. <laughs> he said, I made a big mistake there. Yeah. Yeah. Anyhow, okay. um, and at the end of that end of that ceremony, Butch comes out and then he grabbed my head and gave me a big lick and the people went bananas. Nice. So after wrestling, which, I mean, you still continue to be a part of wrestling, but you uh, focused on your outside ventures as well. You were a uh, owner of a, a gym. Yeah. Before that, mate, I was in Puerto Rico from 201. Dutch Mantel was down there walking, and something happened, and he came back to the States for IWA, and that he just had a big situation angle, and the, the owner, who I'd known, from when he was a kid, um, Victor Quinones, this was against Carlos Colon, the opposition, IWA. And mm-hmm. uh, he'd done a big angle. I'd flow it in and worked on those Christmas shows where they did the big angle. And then the next month, they brought me in as the booker. And oh. um, and uh, I was there booking right up to when Victor, Victor died. Victor um, had a heart attack in about uh, 19... Uh, 1998, 97. Oh, I stayed there as a booker, and that, yeah. and uh, when he finished, booker, he had his finger on the pulse. He yeah. he had he had billboards. You know that when you drive into cities, the big billboards and all that sort of stuff. He'd huh? trade time on television because he had he had um 
40, he had 46 minutes instead of 44. And uh, he, oh, he'd, he'd trade time on a show and give these people something on the show and he'd get the billboards and all that. He was a great promoter. Nice. You know, King Jonas. Carlos Cologne, now the company that we're working against, Saturday night we'd, we'd do 5,000 people and Carlos would be doing 400. Yeah, we took over. We took oh, over in that, and I was down there as Booker right through for a period. Dutch came back for a while, then he went to that new company called Impact. Well, what, yeah. it was TWA at the start. Oh, yeah, TNA Wrestling, yeah. TNA Wrestling, yeah. Dutch mm-hmm. left uh, Jerry Jarrett and went with Jeff Jarrett on that, and I stayed down there. Dutch came back for another year, and then, and then he left. And then well, and, um, I was down there. The co-owners of that company were Sabio Vega and Miguel Perez. And Sabio Vega is going to be, um, at the end of this month, he's going to be at The Undertaker's final final dance. And he's one of the guest people there. Oh, nice. Yeah, so uh, I was down there. I was down there. Um, there for that company from uh, the start of 202, Christmas 201, right up to 208. I lived there to 212. I started coming back in the States then. That's when Victor died. I stayed for about six months. And then I started working in the States again, weekends, just flying in and doing Friday, Saturday, Sunday, or Friday, or Saturday and Sunday around the States in Canada. Nice. And then in 212, I had a, I had a, all the time I worked in WWF, I had a home on Indian Shores, Indian Rocks Beach. It's between St. Petersburg and Clearwater, Florida. You know, there's a lot of little towns along the waterfront there between those two big beaches. They're all, it's all beach along there, but uh, Indian Shores, I had a home right on the water there. And that I lived there, and that so I went to Puerto Rico, and um, and then when I came back from Puerto Rico, um, I, now I live in a suburb about um, 20 minutes away from there. It's a little township. It's next. It's Clearwater Beach. I'm, to drive to Clearwater Beach from my home is only about 15 minutes, but I'm right behind the Blue Jay Stadium. In, in Dunedin, Florida. Nice. And uh, the way I understand it, you're actually working on a new book with uh, Jonathan, or I mean John uh, Crowther. Yes, John John Crowther. Yeah. I had the gym. I had a gym from two. When I came back here, I had a gym from from the a week after I came back, right up to um, this time last year. The landlord. Um, new landlord bought, bought the plaza where the gym was and put my, uh, <laughs> like all landlords, new landlords, put my rent up 5000 a month. Oh, damn. Yeah, he wanted me out. He wanted the whole plaza to just have restaurants and bars. And, you know, a gym is a great thing because the people after the gym go for a drink or eat and whatever, but he didn't want it there. Now that, that, gym, that gym is a games room and a bar. That stinks. That uh, yeah, that it unfortunately ended up going that direction. But I I've heard uh, from people that you had a lot of talent that would come in and out of your gym when you were when you were active. Very active, yeah, yeah. If I think of the talent and that, I had and movie stars too. Nice. A lot of people come to the beach. Across the road was a notorious hotel, one of the most expensive, and um on the beach and that uh, cheapest room was around the season cheapest room was a thousand a night his hotels around there on the beach was some rooms three thousand a night thousand oh wow hours. crazy yeah. huh definitely I know I won't be staying there anytime soon no and that and, uh, you know I had a lot of movie stars and a lot of wrestlers and that yeah. of course of course Terry that was his gym Terry came there all the time. 
Oh, Dave. Hulk Hogan. Yeah, you guys are uh, good buddies, aren't you? Friends, yeah, good, yeah, good friends. Nice. Yeah, I was going to say, it sounds like uh, throughout your time in professional wrestling, one thing that was a constant is that you uh, had a lot of good times and a lot of uh, good friends in the sport of professional wrestling. Yeah. I've had a lot of downs, though, mate. I've had restaurants, too. One of them I got rid of, you know, and that made money on. And then the other ones, I've, uh, I've I've been going overseas for a long time and that, and uh, come back and they've raped me. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. Management have raped me and that. So, you know, it was lobsters and and all that sort of going out and bottles of stuff and coming back, closing at 12, coming back at 3 and partying in the restaurants till just 5 or 6 in the morning, you know. Oh, I saw it on the... You know, through the door afterwards, where afterwards I saw through the the company they put the door system in, the people were coming in and partying and all that sort of stuff. Ah, oh, sheesh. Yeah, I had a lot of bad bad runs there. Yeah. Definitely. So I've had my ups and downs. Yeah, but a lot it's of money like, there. Yeah, I was going to say it sounds like though for the most part you had more ups than you had downs though. Yeah. It's a bad time now, mate. It's sad how it is. I, you know, I still get out on the road, believe it or not, and, and travel the country. The last time I traveled was in in February this year. I was in Canada, selling, um, working at a trade show, selling television show, wrestling television show, and and that sort of stuff to different television companies across the state, across Canada. So I understand that uh, if things get better over the next two months or so, 2021 is going to be a uh, big tour for the uh, yes. Butch. Yes. Butch hasn't toured. He, when he comes to the Hall of Fame, we didn't do any signings. Um, we did a private one at midnight, one in the morning, and that. But um, the rest of the time, you know, we were busy with Vince, and that, and that was over on the, on, on the on the West Coast. That was the new, the new Forty Nine er Stadium. Nice. What's it called? The new, I don't forget the name of it. You got me on that one. I was going to say, and I even used to be a Niners fan, and I can't remember uh, who sponsored it at this point. But I, I remember that was the site of the WrestleMania. Yeah, that was the the WrestleMania was the first thing in that stadium. The football season hadn't started. Anyhow, um, yeah, but. Where were we? Oh, you were about to tell us about um, about where fans can learn more about you on social media, on the web, on that kind of thing. Yeah, they can um, find me on on Bushwhacker Bushwhackerloop dot com website, and I've got I've got a lot of Bushwhacker stuff there, and a lot of doll um, action figures and memorabilia to go up. They'll be going up in the next week on that on that website, and I can be found on um, Instagram Bushwhacker Luke, and Twitter and Facebook Bushwhacker Luke. And definitely, I mean, they make great uh, holiday presents with Christmas coming up. Uh, people can go onto that website, order gifts. Uh, you'll even you'll probably you do autographs, right, and customizations that kind of thing. Yes, yes, I do. And w- once I get all this. Uh, once I get all this new merchandise up on on the site, I'll be doing video calls where you can be on Facebook Facebook time with me or, or on um, WhatsApp, and we can be talking, and I can show you while I sign the products you buy. So you'll be yeah. able to choose something, and you can watch me put my John Henry on it. How about that, folks? Keep an eye on my um, Facebook because I do a lot of um, – Facebook virtual uh, signings. Hey, you just did one with the uh, the Heinzes, uh, Dylan and uh, Bobby. Yeah, yes, I did one there. Then I just did one in New Zealand, and I'm just going to I'm setting up to do one in England. Nice. Okay. Because of these countries, I'm, I was over to England. Not many. No, I don't think many people have done them directly in England. And one of my long lost friends is setting up a motor in England. He's setting it up. 
Sounds amazing. So it sounds like uh, 2021 is looking to be a busy year for you. It has yeah, been a foot coming over. If, as you said before, everything goes well. Butch is coming over March or April. Nice. It has been a pleasure having you on the show. We definitely enjoyed uh, uh, reminiscing and going over your career and just, I mean, learning all about you. But the nice thing is, for the fans, that this wasn't enough. Uh, you got that book, like you said, with uh, John Crowther that will be coming out that is just going to be an amazing book because he is a great writer. And there's a lot of... It's not so much wrestling in it, a lot of road stories. <laughs> nice. And you'll have a few laughs, well, quite a few laughs. Sounds good. We, well, we, haven't, we, haven't held back, we haven't held back on anything. Nice. A bit of, we've held back a bit about the, um, the dark side of Singapore and Bangkok. We've held, about, held back about that. <laughs> I know what you mean. Yeah, I was going to say some parts, it's okay to leave out a little bit of that. But uh, definitely, for the most part. the jungle, people, you won't believe this, he drove through the jungle when there was a curfew. No no people on the road. And we can hear him tat, 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 tat in the the distance, in the jungle, right beside us. You know, the elephants are working, the... the, um, the um, sugar canes, and they've got bullocks working, hoeing up the fields, elephants rolling the sugar cane and bum bundles. And um, and you can hear way in the distance, you can hear the rat tat tat of guns. And uh, there's Butch and me driving up through, through, through Asia at the time. It wasn't, Mal- it wasn't Malaysia then, it was Asia. Oh, wow. That's going back in time. Definitely. In the 60s, yeah. And, of course, we've had a bit of that happy, happy grass. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we've got, we've got uh, B-A-L-L-S as, as, as strong as steel driving up there. We're not caring a bit about what's going on in the distance. Definitely. I mean, it sounds, sounds amazing. I'm looking forward to reading John's book. Because uh, I've I've read a lot of his other stuff, and I I think it's like you said, it's going to be uh, just a deeper look into the the road and all the stories. I mean, it just it sounds amazing. So Luke, uh, I'd like to thank you for joining us tonight. It has been just awesome having you as a guest. It's great to be on your show, mate. And um, for all the people out there, I get, when is this going to air, mate? Oh, this should be airing in uh, about a week. We'll have it posted. Give, you can post it to me so I can tell people. And um, to all the people out there, happy Thanksgiving. Stuff that turkey down. You have a few cold ones on me, but stay off the roads. And if you're out on the roads, don't have alcohol on, but make sure you're wearing a mask when you go into stores. Definitely. Great advice. And on the, on the, on the back of that, a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Okay, mate, it's nice being on the show with you. Uh, the grueling... Grueling what, truth. The, huh? the, grueling. the grueling truth. It's great to be on the grueling truth. Guys, have a good night. Have a good day wherever you are in the world. This is Bushwhacker Luke saying, I'm out. Whoa! Awesome. <laughs>